Yeah, thank you very much. I know it's hard shortly before the lunch break uh, to catch your attention. I try to keep it short. Um, but thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Um, I would also like to say thank you that today we have uh, students from the Macromedia here, and they're not only students from the Macromedia, they are part of um, our research project, um, which, which is called uh, The Moving Network. Uh, one welcome to Dana, Rosella, Ellen, uh, Mafalda, and uh, Claudius. Um, yes, you mentioned before, I think, some of the very important points uh, in your speech about uh, intercultural communication and about um, um, the, the engagement of both sides. Um, what I would like, of course, to, to suggest is that we should perhaps um, put that a bit more um, in a scientific perspective in that way that we are dealing um, stronger with structures because a big danger I see here or we see in the in the academic world is that we have a lot of opinions yeah we have a lot of um, normative feelings of course everyone would agree that we have to respect other people yeah everyone would agree that we should uh, be on an equal level uh, on a day-to-day -day basis but if we look on refugees this is perhaps not enough to deal with this very complex um, um, situation we face right now. So, I mean, if we just look on the media, for example, or on the debates we have in the public world, then we can see, yeah, very often there's a political problem, there are human beings called as refugees, yeah, in general, uh, there are histories of flights, there's a history of different arrivals, of safety, of waiting, of fear, of orientation, of jobs and studies, work, cultural irritations, we heard that. And then we are talking very quickly about solutions. Yeah, and this is what you can see right now in a lot of initiatives here in Germany, that everyone is a, is a kind of a competition, yeah? Who has the right solution, the one, yeah? Who can bring refugees to the job market? Or who can integrate them? These are huge topics. Yeah? And I mean, all these topics are discussed for years now in research, and they're all problematic. For example, if we talk about integration, just to give you a very simple example, if I talk or listen to one of the students here coming from Morocco or from the United States, and I'm listening to you, then of course you are much more integrated, although you're perhaps a foreigner just being here for three years, as some of the young people in your age living in Berlin Marzahn or in Berlin Lichtenberg, yeah? Never entered a university, uh, living with totally different values like people or students from Germany which are sitting, who are sitting in my class. So if we talk about integration, yeah? It's suddenly about culture and cultural backgrounds. But if we look more precisely on it, perhaps it is uh, about social um, um, issues and that we have to say that a lot of Germans are not integrated in the value system of our society. So you see how difficult this term is um, if we uh, go a bit deeper, yeah? So it's not about, for us, it's not about talking inter in, in intercultural ways. We would more talk about transcultural issues. Because what Homi Baba, you surely know this name, once said was, that if you say there is an intercultural encounter, then you fix that a person from Turkey must play the Turkish role, and the per person from Germany must play the German role, because that's inter, it's between, yeah? To give you a little anecdote here, I have a good, very good friend of mine, he's a writer here in Berlin, his name is Dennis Utlu. He's born, he was, he's born in Germany, but he has a Turkish name, and the parents are from Turkey. And he says, do you know what? It's very interesting. If when I get invitations, then I'm always on conference like here yeah, about migration and integration and what it means to have a migration background. No theater ever invited me for talking about the Jewish po poet Paul Celan, who is my favorite poet. I have to say a lot more things about Paul Celan, this Jewish writer, as about migration. It's not my topic. But because I'm a writer and my name is Dennis Utlo, everyone expects that I have to say something about migration. 
That's the same with friends of mine, artists who are from Vietnam or um, where the parents are from Namibia, yeah? So that's also diversity, to have one people who is black on stage. And then he has to tell something about it. But this is most of the time not their story. Therefore, the term intercultural encounter is very difficult for us in the current debate because it fixes a certain kind of role. And this is the same with refugees. If you are a refugee and you are smart enough to speak a good English or even German, then you can make a living right now. You are invited everywhere. You can tell your story. You can speak about your um, expectations, but always in a role as a refugee, not as Mohammed Hassan, who studied, let's say, English literature and has to tell something about English literature. This is what you have said, what, what a person can bring to a society. No, this is what the German society does right now. They fix people on their background. Problematic, probably problematic. So, and if we look, for example, on these pictures, I think what we see is a group of people who doesn't have on this picture a history or a story. They're just refugees. It's a homogeneous group of people where we feel um, probably sadness and where we don't expect that this person, let's say, in the middle is an artist. Or here, even worse. So we see a crowd of people without a face. We are seeing refugees, but we are seeing no individuals any longer. It's different with this person here. Because you're studying here cultural diplomacy, though I thought it could be interesting for you because I'm a cultural scientist also to talk a bit about the role of the arts. Um, this person you see here is Ramadan Ali. He is a member of our association, Board of Participation. And he's, a, he's an actor. And he fled 2011 from Syria and he survived through his art. Because he is a Kurd, he's an actor, he is educated as actor in Syria. And um, the Assad regime took him into prison. They tortured him because he's a Kurd. And then he could only flee because he was acting at the borders. In Syria, he was playing a gay person, yeah, because they, they, they don't have a public debate about homosexuality, so they thought, kick the gay person out, yeah. Then uh, in Turkey, he played a track drug addicted um, young man, and the Turkish border control thought, yeah, we put him out. In Greece, he told the story that he ha would have uh, has um, HIV. Oh my God, that's dangerous. Put him out. Yeah. So he survived through his competence to be a good actor. And then he came to Germany and he started to learn German quite quickly. And today you can see him here. He plays in different uh, theaters in German. And had, what he always says in the interviews we, we, we uh, conducted with him was that most of the time they ask him for playing a terrorist. This is the favorite role, yeah? And he put on Facebook on his website this uh, little statement here, yeah? And the one says terrorist, the other is artist, Künstler, means artist. And you see how the perception is changing if you look on these two pictures. And he says, for him, it is very important to make one thing clear. I'm an actor who is also a refugee, but I'm not a refugee who is also an actor. That makes the difference. Do we look, first of all, on the competencies of people and not what kind of status they have or where they come from? Because he says, uh, as an actor, it is the same situation as for a German actor. He wants to play different roles. He wants to show that he is a good actor, that he, he doesn't want just to express the terrorist face, because this is what the German, German audience expects, that he can play this role very well. So therefore, we have to ask ourselves, first of all, um, who defines our roles and how much do we reflect here Western images? And this is about knowledge. And I mean, you can ask yourself, how many 
and I'm not asking the colleagues from Tunisia or from Morocco. I'm asking the students and the members here who are coming from Europe or from the Western world. How many contemporary writers from Syria, musicians, painters, discourses you know? Are you familiar with the contemporary situation before the war in Syria? Most of the Germans we have met and asked in our interviews, for example, or in conversations, they say we want to help refugees. We want to do something. We want to give something to them. We want to enable them. But in the moment you ask, what are you knowing actually about the, the cultural backgrounds? Well, I think it's the same, uh, for example, if we would talk about Romania yeah, or about these countries. I mean, you have a very rich um, um, uh, cultural scene in your country. Yeah? One of your directors won the Oscar. So there is a richness in this country. But ask one German about the contemporary art scene or media scene, even in Poland, in the neighbor country. They don't have a clue. I can prove this because I was conducting a study uh, with over 415 interviews with uh, students. And I asked them the question, can you mention from the neighbor, eastern neighbor country three contemporary artists? 96% could not give a, a proper answer, but 98 could give a proper answer concerning countries like the UK or the United States. Also, there is an <laughs> ocean between. Yeah? It's about knowledge and about associations we have. And if you're interested to read more about this approach, um, I can recommend to you the work of the French sociologist uh, Bruno Latour. He uh, says we should not speak about intercultural communication. Because then we have in mind all the time it is about coming from a certain culture. He's saying it's more interesting to speak about the cultural associations or in general the associations you have when we talk to each other. And so for example, if you are coming, let's say from Morocco, and you are a fan of Bayern München, you like soccer, you like the music of, um, let's say, uh, Farouz, you like Berlin, then perhaps we can share more and very quickly, although I'm from Germany, because I'm not loving Bayern München, but Farouz is something, I'm a singer I like very much. Um, but we can share things perhaps much easier as if I would speak with a person coming from my hometown here in Germany, which is not interested at all in these topics and issues. So it's more about the associations we have, not about the cultural background. And we also know from a lot of studies, yeah, and we should, Therefore, I'm always um, um, trying to say that we should base our knowledge on the results we already have in the scientific world. We know quite exactly yeah, that uh, from a lot of studies um, that people, if you talk, for example, about communication, that people coming from a certain country, being in another country, tend to commun communicate the things they think these things are expected. So if you're coming, let's say here in, from Italy, and perhaps uh, our students can confirm this because they are from Italy, then this is a big, uh, some of them, there's a big issue in Germany that the Germans believe people from Italy must be relaxed. They must love life, yeah? They must love to eat in a certain way. They love to dance, yeah? So, and if you go to r Italian restaurants here, also most of them are in the hands of the Albanians, yeah? And you're not seeing so many Italian waiters here. M most of the time they're Albanians. But they play the Italians, yeah? They play saying, buona sera, ah, so prego. Yeah, this is what the Germans expect that they communicate. There's also some interesting studies saying that even the accent is used, a certain kind of accent, of language accent, just to fulfill the expectations, for example, in tourism. So is it about communication? When I see that I, that I have a good chance to, to be a beloved person in this country, when I'm communicating certain things which are expected from my culture, then of course I will go into this direction and communicate exactly like this. 
This is an advantage for some countries like Italy. It is for us Germans very often a disadvantage because you know that we don't, but we very often don't have a very good uh, image about, or our mentality has not a very good image. Um, very often the older generation in other countries uh, still believe that the Germans are a bit distant, yeah? They're, they're a bit cold. And uh, yeah, then you try to avoid this expectation. Yeah, and you, you do something different. So communication is based very often on expectations people have towards you. You're not expressing what you really are. So, and this is perhaps a good basis when we talk about refugees. You have to imagine, because we are working now for over two years in um, camps of Berlin, we conducted over 90 interviews, and we established a case study I present to you in a minute, and also in the afternoon you can talk to Alan Tabakovic about this more in detail, um, where we try to find out what they really want to do or what they expect. And first of all, we could find out that we're dealing here with people with completely different biographies and completely different ideas about integration. So which ideas do we have in mind when we talk about integration? First of all, is it our wish to integrate refugees or individual biographies? What does it mean? For example, if you choose your friends, then you choose your friends on the basis of some parameters you have. Can you share common aesthetical interests? Um, is it a nice person? Do you probably study the same thing or things you are interested in? And then you make your decision, your social decision. This is a bit different here with refugees because we have a lot of initiatives in Germany saying we want to do something with refugees. Doesn't matter where they come from or what background they have. And so it happens very often, for example, in language courses that people are not willing to learn the German language. And this is also a freedom we should accept that someone says, I'm not willing to learn German. I'm 50 years old, I speak English quite well, I see it works in Germany. And then the Germans say, but you know, to have, if you'd like to have a future here, you should learn German. Then the first pressure comes. But we should respect, of course, if we're talking to adults, that someone can say, I don't want to learn it, with all the consequences. This is respect. Also, to give someone the possibility to make a decision which is probably, in our eyes, a wrong one. That leads us to the second point. Do we think in terms of solidarity or cooperation? Here, I would like to mention the American sociologist um, Richard Sennett. I think you're familiar with him. He's a scholar of Michel Foucault. And uh, he said in one of his last books um, called Together about the rituals and pleasures of cooperation, that the term solidarity, for example, how it is used right now in the refugee debate in Germany every day, is a quite problematic one. Because solidarity, he says, is something you're forced to. And all the big develop or political movements in the 20th century, from fascism to communism to Maoism and also the religions, always told the people you need to show solidarity. In the Second World War, solidarity with Germany, yeah? Fight for your country, um, murder the Jews, uh, conquer the East, eastern part of Europe because you do that for your country and therefore you have to stand together. 20 years later in communism, the same. Don't think about your individual needs, yeah? You do that for the big idea of communism. Yeah? Therefore, we need solidarity. We have to work together. We don't have to look on these bourgeois personal interests. And today, in a, of course, different context, but the government uses the same argumentation. The German government says, we need to have solidarity. Go to the camps, help language courses, and bring clothes, do something. And it's good, for, of course, it's nothing bad, but the interesting question is, at which point comes this concept to its end? Because in this way, solidarity means that you give something, you, you're just, are you feeling good also doing this? But you're not asking 
what the other person actually wants to have. Perhaps they don't would like to have a language course because they're longing for something completely else and therefore you have to ask this person. And in our project, we are using also, as you have mentioned in your um, fascinating presentation about CTAR, we are using uh, the term also cooperation. It's about cooperation. Yeah? Cooperation means that a person can say, this is something I, want, I would like to give and it has not to be on the same level but you exchange something, you share something. And this can be also negative things in cooperation. And you know, we had this debate after Cologne. This was very interesting, for example, that um, after Cologne, after this uh, New Year's Eve night, we had the big debate uh, in some new newspapers where, in the, especially in the right wings, where people said, okay, we have a problem with, the, uh, there's a sexual problem in the DNA of the young men from the Arabic world. Yeah? They all, yeah, that was the tendency, they all have a problem with women. They can, they're not able to express, would you like to have a drink with me? No, they're just grabbing where they shall not have their hands. Then we had the other side, more from the left wing argumentation. They said, no, this is racism. This is not proven. This is not true. They are, they are on the same level and they're thinking with women in the same way like we do. And then we had some scientific voices saying, okay, perhaps we should first of all ask from which background came these people who did these negative things. But what I missed and what I didn't see in the whole debate was in German TV, a young man from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Syria, who would have said, I'm also 25 years old. I'm also a refugee. But this is not part of our culture. This doesn't, perhaps there are some people thinking like this, but it's not the same, it's not the whole picture. And that would have been convincing for me to have a person, an internal voice, who can, or which can make clear, okay, there are differences. What we could see was German voices judging another culture. And this is perhaps problematic. So, and here perhaps for a minute, let's look on this term integration and why we think that integration is a very, very complicated uh, term. Perhaps you can focus your attention on the colors within the next slides. For example, this is a picture from uh, the Prussian army. And uh, according to German studies, if you ask German people um, what they understand um, when they use the term um, uh, integration, then very often the term or the German word Eingliederung comes up. And Eingliederung is a word coming from this time where, um, you, um, where in the Prussian army the soldiers stood in rank and file yeah, and if there was someone who was a bit like this, then the officer came and said, okay, Eingliederung, go back, be in row, be a homogeneous picture, like you can see here. So this is the idea of integration as creating a people into a homogeneous group um, of behaviors. And you can imagine this is this is boring and this is not the truth because then we also should look on a lot of groups from Germany which are not integrated in that way. Then we have a more modern one you can see here. So this is quite in fashion in a lot of seminars that um, in universities and in these uh, study programs they explain the different terms with this picture you see here. Uh, exclusion, that's clear, that would mean that you have a majority group in the middle and then people are outside. Separation is that there is no actually communication between the groups. Then you have integration where you have the people um, protected within the majority group and you have inclusion where everything um, is, is mixed. Yeah? Interesting is here, when we look on the colors and to ask ourselves, for what do the colors stand? Then we can imagine this is the cultural background. It's really about the colors. And perhaps this picture is um, the most interesting one. We, we would use in our research project uh, where we say um, it is not about the color of the people or the cultural background. It is about what they have 
to offer what they would like to share, what they would like to exchange, and you said this already, and I would add here to your argumentation, and what they would like to build together. What can they build together? And this is interesting. Because here it doesn't matter if someone is at home perhaps an orthodox Catholic person or perhaps has orthodox ideas about the Islam, as long as this is fine with our constitution, this is part of his freedom. And I never would care about it, but I would care if this is in the debate when we work together. For example, if I have students in my class, we have some goals together we want to reach. And it is fine if someone comes from Egypt or from Alaska or from uh, Guatemala to bring in the perspectives, but I don't expect that. I, don't, I never would force my students to say, uh, okay, because you're from Italy, I expect you're always taking the Italian perspective. Because this is what the people bring. This is interesting. What they have in their hands. If this is something completely different, if this is from a Turkish writer, um, his expertise about Paul Celan, wonderful. That's, inter or that's not integration, but this is actually a completely different idea how we could live together. So in the last 10 minutes, let me um, introduce you now uh, to the Moving Network. This is our um, research project based on over 90 interviews. Um, and um, as I told you, first of all, we asked the refugees in five different camps, uh, what are their expectations, what are their problems, what are their hopes, and what we could find out is that they want to do something and they want to feel respected in a certain role. And most of the time in the role, for example, if they have studied cultural sciences in Syria, then they would like to be seen here in Germany as a cultural scientist or to do at least something in the field of cultural sciences. Um, or if you had been an artist, we have in our team now one artist, uh, she, she is a painter, and she says, of course, I want to be respected not as a refugee who also paints, but as a painter who can bring in Syrian perspectives. So, and um, what we did was that we um, developed a model how that could work to how to describe that in the right way, how, that, 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 they, that, they can come, that they can work on an equal level and that they feel respected, yeah? And that is not solidarity. So, and what we did is our association has the name Board of Participation, and we started with a case study and we said that in uh, over, I think, five camps, right? Five camps, um, we have um, um, so-called Bob ambassadors. And these are... Um, you see here Samir, the boy with the red t-shirt. And these are uh, people who we trained, we spoke to, they are trusting us. They have a business card, Bob Ambassador, or just Bob, the same business card as we all have. Yeah. And our task for them was just offer in the camps courses in the field of cultural education, media education. We're not saying what you shall do, but do something where you can see that people regularly come, that they like it, that it is interesting for them, um, and you, we just want to have reports about how many people attend regularly, what is the content, and so forth and so on. And we had been surprised that this was a huge success. So you see here, for example, uh, Samir, uh, in his camp, he is teaching men from Afghanistan, other men from Afghanistan, um, language because they are illiterates. And now the interesting point, they never talked or said it to the German teachers and to the authorities that they cannot write and, sp and, and read because this is a matter of shame. But they said it to Samir because they trust him. And so they joined his courses. And therefore we believe our this is our special approach. We also can scientifically prove now on the basis of our material that before you can speak about integration, about access to the job market, 
and all these things, you need to implement here so-called multipliers. People who have already experiences with the German society, who have trust in their communities, and who can explain how it works here. And that was so interesting to see the very often in these talks, the men from Afghanistan, but also young men and women from Syria said to our Bob ambassadors, I mean, look, the Germans are a bit crazy. Yeah? Yes. What they have with the women's stuff and uh, equal, they want to talk about everything endlessly. Come on, what is this? Yeah? Then they, 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 yeah, they want to help all the time. So, and you can imagine that in that moment when a guy like Samir or Hala, she is also one of our Bob ambassadors, when a person coming from this trust circle, from their own community, says, look, this is not just a German thing. This is really how it works here. If you want to have a way here, you just, you just should reflect what is, what's, what is going on around you. And here we can see that they start listening in a completely different way. Yeah? And therefore we have developed this model here. Uh, this is the wrong title, by the way, but um, we changed this for the next presentation. So we, we, we developed this model and we, we, this is on a theoretical basis and this is based on uh, different studies. We don't have the time to go deeper here into the material. But what you can see here, the first level, the red one, is that refugees come to Germany um, looking for safety and um, we're speaking here about a safety trust circle. Then there are certain peer groups in the camps that must not Mean, that must not mean all the time the ethnical background. You can also, if you're a homosexual, then of course you will try to find out other homosexuals in your camp, also to be protected here in Germany, because there is a lot of struggle in the camps. You can imagine if there a farmer from Aleppo lives the first time side of side with a young man who kisses in the courtyard of other young men, or who just expresses that he is gay, this is a clash. This is not an intercultural clash, this is a this is a, an intracultural clash. So, so you're looking for peer groups, you're looking for certain um, trust circles, and here we start our work. In this first Neville, Neville network, we are identifying our multipliers, our Bob ambassadors. And they start to teach, to work, to train within this first level network. And they get a certificate for this. So, there's also a trigger that it is interesting for, for them to do that. And also the other members get a, uh, uh, receive a certificate. And then on the next level, in the second level network, we also invite these Bob ambassadors to conferences to come with us. I mean, here, I think I can express this, it is not paid, so there is no money. Therefore, we didn't ask our uh, Bob ambassador because we think it is important that they get paid. And we can see that this is working. And i show you another picture here. This is Bashar al-Rifai, one of our ambassadors. Um, and we had been invited to a seminar with the German police. And we said, OK, we come if we can bring one of our Bob ambassadors. And you have to pay this ambassador for the speech. And the police did it. And you can imagine it was very interesting. Bashar, when we asked him the first time, he said, oh, actually, contact with the police, I have different experiences here so far. And I said, in this, and I said to him, this time you get paid by the German police. <laughs> and and he, was, um, he was, of course, quite happy. And I know that we have come to an end now, but interesting for us is that the Bob ambassadors tell and told us so often, in our project is the first time that we are not feeling being treated as refugees who have to say thank you and grateful, we feel respected in our role, in our competencies, and we are really here on an equal level. And that you, uh, for example, uh, you're not believing what I'm telling you, and you know that in, in sciences it's always about giving proof. <laughs> um, so therefore, I would like to invite you uh, next Wednesday, here you see our um, Bob Ambassador Hala al Haik or Haik, I think it's right in the Arabic world, uh, language. Um, and this is her first public speech here in Berlin about um, integration and identity at the Refugio Sharehouse. I will give the introduction. 
And this is for us really wonderful to see that they're developing as teachers now and that we can train them, that we can bring them in contact, that they get with other uh, scientists, that we can pay them. Um, and for example, Bashar al-Rifai um, has left the camp, found an own apartment, and has his first job now, his first contract. And therefore, we believe perhaps this is not the big solution. But if a lot of institutions in Germany would start to work with multipliers instead of searching from a German perspective the ideal solution for refugees, perhaps we would come a step further. Thank you very much. Thank you, for, thank you Professor Wolfram, for the interesting presentation, for having shared your project with us. It was very interesting. I particularly like the part about Italy. <laughs> Um, we have time for a couple of brief questions. Um. Hello, my name is Linda. I'm from Kenya. Um, I really like your presentation. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the multiplier effect, uh, particularly because when I came to Germany, I had a Kenyan friend help me learn the ropes. So that's very important. And uh, you talked a lot about the... Um, multiply effect, especially for, no, the acceptance of refugees, not as refugees first, but as experts in a certain field first, then refugees. Mm -hmm. um, then what happens to the people who do not, who are in the middle, the 22 year olds who have just come out of university, they don't know exactly what they're good in, mm -hmm. and they're trying to find a place in, you know, the job market, and they're trying to develop their career. How do you handle that? Yeah, I would say it is a very good question, but it is the same um, as for a German student. I mean, if a German student comes out from the university and he has, for example, studied political sciences, yeah, uh, or as I did, yeah, German philology, then all the adults tell you, okay, you're unemployed now for a long period of time because there are no jobs for people like you, yeah? Um, so, and then you have to find out by asking other people, perhaps, who, who are in the same situation, what can you do, yeah? And we have a lot of, of course, um, students working here in restaurants or in bars, and this is also easy in the meanwhile, not easy, but it is easier to access for refugees uh, if they have the status to work, uh, that they can find such jobs. But then, exactly, it is important that you make clear actually I have studied and this is not my future to stay here in the restaurant, yeah? So I have to find out how can I make my competencies or my interests visible, so. And that means if you are sitting all the time in courses where you bake together with other refugees or dance or sing, yeah? And you do all this funny stuff we're doing right now with refugees. This is not, I think, a proper way um, for their professional life. Yeah? Here we should have Bob ambassadors who perhaps went the same path, went the same way, and can tell them, I can recommend to you this is the best um, step, the next step, perhaps you should um, take a business English class or you should uh, apply for support uh, for, or you should try to, to um, improve um, your, your studies. Yeah? There are a lot of offers right now, but you need someone from your community who can explain that to you because the German expectations are, are, um, um, are in a way, very often in a way that they think, okay, they understand what we mean, yeah? But here are communicational issues yeah, where we need this translation. So this, is my, this would be my, my advice, to look for um, people who went that path until who can give you proper uh, information. Please. I got the microphone. <laughs> I got the power. I've been waiting patiently uh, for the last day and a half. I think this uh, discussion, not just your presentation, your contribution, but in general has been devoid of one very vital and essential question. You know, the question of why are they here to begin with and who's responsible? I don't think it's prudent, advisable, logical to talk about integration and identity, and I'm not just pinpointing 
your t subject here, without talking about why you're here. And to me, I'm very familiar with the term integration because I'm from Detroit. And if you don't know about Detroit, Detroit has the largest population, Arab-speaking population outside of North Africa and uh, the Arab Peninsula. So I'm very familiar with Arab culture to some degree. I think it's, um, why is it, and I'm gonna ask you a direct question, you know, not because you've been avoiding anything, but I'm gonna ask you because yeah. you're here. Why don't we have this discussion about who's responsible for whoever is coming into the country, uh, fleeing whatever, why are they here? Because it's strange, if one would assume that the, that the place where they're going houses the people who are responsible, then what you're asking them to do is to integrate with those people and their mindset, whoever that might be, if you follow my logic yeah. there. One comment on sexual harassment in Cologne, and I condemn any sexual harassment. My mom always told me, keep your hands to yourself, period, unless you're invited. Uh, that, that's my rule. But I was talking to a German woman. She said, damn, this happens every year at the Oktoberfest, long before the, any Arab set foot on the continent of, uh, of, of, uh, of Europe in, in this modern era. Every year people are arrested in different scenarios and different gathering, uh, gatherings for sexually harassing women. This is not a new thing. It's endemic to every society on this planet. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I was in the United States Army for four years. What I have seen, what I saw in Vietnam, messes with my mind to this very day. I'm talking about everything across the board, pedophilia, rape, whatever you want to talk about, United States military did it. Let's be clear on some things here. Let's be very clear. And that's my big problem with a lot of these things that happen, a lot of these discussions, that we never really get down to the heart of the issue. In my estimation, now this is just my perspective, all right? And yes, Arab men harass women. American men harass women, German women, uh, men harass women. I think you get my point, you know? And it's time to stop this. I don't understand why this happens that people do not tackle the difficult questions, you know? And what do we have as a result of not tackling di difficult questions? This whole schlamassel in you know, America with Donald Trump and Clinton and how could it be that we got these people now? Because people do not deal with the real issues, mm -hmm. you know. Um, one other thing. Anybody seen Lawrence of Arabia? Anybody? Anybody seen it? No, not Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I love you, bro. <laughs> no, Lawrence of Arabia. A an another version. Uh, it's a bit like Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, part two. <laughs> Here's what we're dealing with here. And there's been a big controversy about this. Peter O'Toole. He played the Englishman. He played Lawrence. Alec Guinness played the, was he, play, did he play Faisal? Was it Faisal he played? No, he played the, 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 the. He played an Arab. Yeah. But I thought it was Faisal. King Faisal? You don't know the movie. Or you don't remember. But it's okay. No problem. Anthony Quinn, who happens to. It was uh, Omar Sharif who no. played. No he, no, he didn't play. No, no, he was riding. He was dressed in black and riding a horse and okay. always interacting with Peter O'Toole. No. Long time ago. Yeah, okay, but anyway. So you have Omar Sharif, who was a very famous Egyptian um, actor, very fine actor, who played a, an Arab, <laughs> strange that it may seem. Anthony Quinn, who's actually Mexican, played another Arab. The question was, was put forward about, do, do you, 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 you pose the question, does anybody know any Syrian... Um, authors or poets, you know? Well, the fact of the matter is for the last 500 years, those people, the conquerors, have put forward their agenda. They put forward their religion. They put forward their culture. And in some cases, some of this was good. I'm not uh, gonna denigrate everything that was put forward, 
All right. But as far as understanding, you know, the contributions, the cultural and scientific and whatever contributions that other societies make, they were put in the background and still remain in the background. That's why we don't know. That's why we don't know about writers in Brazil or in Cuba or in Syria or in Iraq. You, you get my point. So I have a lot more to say, but I want to reserve that for later on today. All right, so, yeah. okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, there's a lot of uh, topics you brought up now, um, but uh, to, to uh, just uh, quickly answer the first one. Yeah, it is a political issue, and there are a lot of opinions, of course, around here, yeah? So, um, in Germany, so, uh, who is responsible for what, yeah? But I, uh, I agree to you, there is not so much knowledge about the inner politics in the Arabic world, yeah? We don't, we, are, we never had been educated about this in school, uh, also in the university. This is not, this is American history, British, European uh, history. This is still the, the common stuff uh, we, 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 we learn, yeah? We're, but we don't have a clue about the complexity of the politics in the Arabic world. And um, I mean, yes, there should be also a political awareness, but this is always dangerous because, you know, we have a lot of right-wing politicians now in Germany saying, yeah, um, the problem is um, that the other Arabic countries don't take them. These are the right brothers for them. Yeah. Then we have the left-wing politicians very often saying, "Welcome refugees," whatever that should mean. Yeah. I mean, there's it's uh, it's not allowed to speak in Germany about numbers, but even the the, the British um, uh, economist Paul Collier, who is really not a right-wing uh, person, is an Oxford professor. He says there is a certain amount of number when you Go, come over this number, then it is not possible to, to have any sustainable form of cooperation um, between migrants, refugees, and uh, the other inhabitants. They're just, you know, practical numbers we can uh, keep, uh, take here into consideration. So it is quite complex, you can imagine, for Germans uh, to, to um, uh, deal, with that, deal with that. Therefore, I'm actually quite happy that we don't start here with a political dis uh, discussion. Uh, but that we are talking about uh, the situation we have right now um, where we, of course, see that some of the people will go back after the war or if the war is, is ending, and hopefully that happens in the next years. But a lot of people will also stay here, yeah? And they like Germany. And I mean, this is a compliment for us. After this history in the 20th century, that we have one of the largest expatriates communities from young people from Israel here in Berlin, and that we also have thousands of young refugees who, who say, of course, we want to go to Berlin, yeah, because, or to Germany, or to some special places, because we think that's good for us. So Germany should take this situation to change and not to fear what is going on. Yeah? There's a big challenge on the one hand, on the other hand, it is a big also opportunity for the German society to become really an international player um, in, in, in a positive way so that we can, that we can um, being identified with other things as all the time with uh, uh, the concentration camps, yeah? This is something where the young generation, I think this is part of this whole solidarity thing that the young generation in Germany also enjoys very much that they have this international attention and, and positive feelings, they, they come to them. So this is also a positive moment for Germany that we can be, that we can creating another image for this country. I think this is something positive. But there was another question. One more and last question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Really okay. okay, I guess everybody's hungry. Um, uh, thank you, this is very interesting and uh, I really like the colors that uh, you used. Uh, and of course, I think the, the whole notion of inclusion is perhaps uh, the one that appeals the most in terms of, uh, you know, uh, your conversation. Um, integration. Um, I was a couple of weeks ago, I went to see a tax lawyer because I just moved to Berlin. And uh, I was surprised that one of the taxes that he asked me that I should be paying is solidarity tax. Yeah. <laughs> As the name, which right? is which, yeah. uh, which kind of sort of shocked me, but uh, you know I'm supposed to pay for DDR, uh, but I think soon we'll be paying for the uh, for the newcomers. Um, 
Integration. Um, Germany imported labor back in the 60s, mostly from Turkey and then also from uh, North Africa. So actually Germans went to bring them because, uh, you know, unskilled labor with no education, but, you know, basically cheap labor. Um, today you're confronted with something completely different in Germany where, you know, um, you are inviting them actually. They all want to come to Germany, not to Greece or, I mean, even though Greece, the weather is better, or Italy is the weather is... Uh, um, and, um, but uh, academically, I mean, there has been now about 60 years of, quote, Turkish integration in Germany, which to my mind, I mean, is still problematic. I mean, coming newcomer to Germany. Um, now you're gonna be confronted with something that is completely different. Um, many of the Syrians who fled, of course, I mean, they're educated, but also many come from a, a rather conservative Islamic background yeah. or Muslim background. And for me, I think this is perhaps, uh, it's gonna be more of a challenge today for Germany. Uh, to what extent um, the empirical uh, evidence that you have gathered, if you have gathered, on uh, Turkish integration in Germany, um, yes, there have been some success stories, but I think it's mostly donor kebab uh, and, and, and whatnot. But I haven't seen really names of scientists or, or with the, the ones that you mentioned. Very few, very few. I mean, yeah, no, we're talking about, was that 7 million yeah. uh, Turks in Germany? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I visited Humboldt University uh, a couple of days ago just because my daughter mm. is graduating and then she wants to go there. 27 Nobel Prize laureates came out from that university. Huh. HU, okay. Karl Marx, Lenin was there. I, I didn't know that, okay, which is quite, quite amazing. Uh, the question then, um, given the new challenges that Germany would be confronted with, do you think that, um, and given, uh, actually referring a little bit to the experience of the integration from another group, Turks, do you think that integration uh, will present perhaps more challenges with new, newcomers? And to what extent do you think that integration is gonna really happen? Particularly if you look at one dimension which is kinda a little bit overlooked, which is Islam. Yeah, I mean, one more time, my point is, it is why, why we had the problem with the Turkish community here is that since the 1980s, 90s, no German was interested in the cultural background of these people, also not in, in, in the forms of Islam they brought here, because most of the Turks living here in Germany, especially in Berlin, are liberal, have a liberal Islam. So it's easier to get access to the Sehidlik mosque here in Kreuzberg as to come to the Berlin Dome, yeah, because it's always closed or they take money for it. Yeah. So that for example the Sehidlik mosque is totally open. You can go anytime you want and they you can have a tea there to explain everything. They're not radicals. But of course we have also um, but um, yeah, Turkish radical mosque as well here in Berlin. But you know, there's a huge var variety. But the Germans don't even have a clue. What, what is the story of Islam, yeah? So it is a mutual way of learning. This is my big question to all the initiatives who are, which are dealing now with refugees. At which position do you really ready to learn something about the background of the people? Because then we can start what we do in our project. We are sharing our expertise, but for example, Hala, the woman here, she studied Islamic studies and she has a lot of women in her courses who have some very traditional ideas about the Islam. And she says to them, look, I'm as a woman, as a Muslim woman, without scarf, very liberal, but I've studied this. I'm telling you, start thinking. This is a possibility you have here in Germany that you can discover your strong woman, you can uh, discover there are other aspects, we can discuss the Islam in a new way. So I'm talking here especially about not so well educated women who never heard in their home countries that it is that they are asked for their opinion. So, and of course she has also in, their, in her course sometimes women who have studied and who are just interested in the topic, and she can debate with her on a completely different level, of course, yeah? But our goal for integration must be that, of course, we have to defend some of our Western values, for example, equality, tolerance, um, human rights, yeah? And that we have the separation of religion and law. I think this is something where we not should say this, we put that now once again into the debate. 
I, I, I wouldn't recommend this because we have fought for this now for, for a very long time. But what we should not do is just to say, take this. But talking together, how can we, you from your Syrian perspective, we from our German perspective, how can we uh, find formulation where, where we can um, say that these are common values, not just, you know, Western values. It, these are common values where we think and believe in Germany and in Europe that people can find their way no matter what color they have, no matter where they come from. Yeah? And this would be my wish that we have the multipliers who are not just repeating what the Germans tell them, but to formulate own positions supporting these values, but also that we are learning something. This is the most important point I would ask in every initiative. How many things do you know about the background of the people you are dealing with? Thank you very much. It was a really fascinating talk, and I think that's why it's provoked so many questions and discussion afterwards. Um, so I'd like to ask you all to join me in a warm round of applause for Dr. Gernot Wolfram. Thank you very much. Thank you.